Welcome back to my Blaster Master Zero Destroyer Mode guide and walkthrough. We have just completed the revisiting of Area 2, and we are now backtracking from Area 1 to newly available Area 4. Now, I recall this being something you had to do in the original Blaster Master game, which I know probably a lot of people won't be playing because it is a ball bustingly difficult game since. The North American version, for whatever reason, decided to artificially inflate the difficulty because of, you know, limited continues, in which the Japanese version had unlimited. Even though there were some questionable level design changes that were added into the North American version, but probably for the better, since there's this one instance of one of the areas that has a very weird change, which I think is actually in Area 4, actually, because you have to do a very similar jump. But anyway, you have to backtrack to where you started in the beginning of the game, so pardon my um, sloppy performance here, but the story mode can be a bit of a bitch. It is particularly a lot harder on the tank view of gameplay and mostly the interior dungeons with some of the bosses just not being favorable. As I mentioned, particularly being boring at the least offending ones are the ones that take a lot of, like, Drop Trappers, and of course the most offending ones are coming up a little later. Now here, much like in Castlevania 2, you have to, instead of holding down to kneel to a wall, you actually have to use the Hover ability, which I actually use because it actually doesn't consume as much, but this is probably the only time I'm going to really be using this ability since it's, uh, I just really like the Jump ability better. Seriously, I have no idea why you can only... I have no idea why you are not able to use that ability in Zero Two. It is really disappointing. Like, I understand the hover is the more traditional way of doing things, but why can I not have the option? I mean, come on. Why have an ability for just one game and never bring it back? It's so stupid. Oh well. At least this game's still fun. But now we're gonna get into probably... The part of the game where it gets a little bit more challenging, which is known as Area 4, which I believe is the sewer area. There might be a specific name for it, but as you probably may have noticed in the titles, I will be listing the name of the area that is described by the maps that you collect throughout the game, so no need to worry about that. So this area, mainly most of it takes place in the underground. And thankfully, this sewer isn't particularly too bad compared to most sewer levels in games, which one of my good friends has actually just talked to me about a um, sewer level in Banjo-Kazooie, which I unfortunately have not played. Yeah, I know, shoot me now, shoot me now, or would you rather wait till you get home? <laughs> anyway, uh, the, what you want to do in this sewer area is actually keep going down, and there's actually two different sections of this little sewer. I myself would recommend going for the boss first, since that will get you the key, which will let you explore this area fully. And you also need the key in order to access Area 5, the underwater aquatic adventure that will be going through soon. I cannot wait for that bullshit. But because this is a guide to get the best ending, and of course to get that achievement, we have to leave our tank as I have, have proper, just proper skills. And of course, I'm doing the jump up in order to enter this first dungeon, which I believe has the map. Now, let me talk about some strategies of this uh, dungeon, because this one actually does introduce a very interesting gimmick that is not really used outside of this one. And this is known as the, uh, I, I think it's like a flash flood or something. I'm not sure what it is, but if you ever played uh, Metal Gear Solid in the Game Boy Color, it's a very similar mechanic where you have to basically take shelter in the above ground or else you'll be swept away by the water. Now, of course, it won't do a lot of damage, but... You still have to keep this in mind. Now, one thing I really liked about the Switch version is that when you are playing the Switch version, you have that rumble feature, which definitely gives you a bigger tell compared to other versions, and it definitely gives you that authentic experience. Now, the water only seems to hit you if you are, like, I think a tile away from... The, a tile or two away from the wall or something, so... If you absolutely have to get hit by the water, just stay near some water. Do keep in mind that the tadrolls, I believe they're called, the little orange shell things, and the blue blocks, which can only be destroyed by the fire weapon, so make sure you keep that around. 
Uh, speaking of keep around, actually do not go in this direction because this is where uh, I ended up having to do this dungeon several times because the, um, the the below path is a lot more dangerous in the story mode and it may seem more convenient on a normal run, but in the story mode there are a lot more enemies which you may also notice another new type of enemy. I think. It's been a while since I actually recorded this, you have to excuse me, but there's these blue enemies who are essentially like your character, Jason Frudnick, except they only shoot in horizontal and vertical shots, so you'll want to flank them from the uh, slanted sides, you know, so they don't shoot you right away. And you'll want to do this every time you fight one, because they are very annoying. And since their shots go through walls in destroyer mode, they are going to be extra annoying. Now, speaking of annoying, you'll want to make sure you try to light up the, the, these little sons of bitches so you can spare your uh, grenades. You'll want to have at least three for the final section, as I get a neat little double kill right there, which is always nice. And I think I'm just waiting for the um, the waves to go through by right now. So yeah, this is a little tedious, but this took me a quite a while, so I'm kind of just trying not to get fucked. If they do drop the uh, sub weapons, that's great, but uh, do not count on it. These games uh, drop rates are pretty bonkers, so <laughs> uh, just try to have at least ten saved up in case you need them. And this is probably the most bullshit room in in, uh, in the dungeon because you have very little cover, and if you get hit by the water, you are pretty much gonna get hit in the pits, which don't kill you, thankfully, but. You will still take damage, and it's just no fun. And since upgrades are extremely viable in the story mode, you definitely do not want to get hit by those because it's just a recipe for disaster. But you'll want to go to the bottom left of this uh, big map. You do want to head over here, though, for some sweet upgrades if you are in need of them. Though, do come back afterwards so that if you take any hits, you can recover. Don't just go for them right away because you'll, you'll need them for later since... In this game, as I mentioned, you have to actually leave the dungeon hall for your progress to count. You can't just quit. Which I'm very glad that they fixed in Zero Two, but I so would have very much liked having a manual optional leaving instead of just having Fred predeterminedly have you leave whenever you get an item, which makes revisiting dungeons extremely annoying. But now that we got the goods, we're gonna go ahead and leave, but because this game is good, quote unquote. Actually, I'm kidding, this game is fucking great. It's, it's seriously a great game. Uh, we're going to go ahead and actually gather up some supplies, which I believe are some weapon upgrades. And unfortunately, you can't really see because I did a shitty job, but... Those blocks definitely do have some goodies, so make sure you get them. And now, since I'm going to be backtracking, I'm going to be talking about some other things about this uh, area that's annoying. So... <laughs> I, myself, just do not much care for this area at all. Like... I like the music, but I just think it's kind of a pace breaker, but the one good thing I will say about this area in general is that you only really have to go through the bottom parts once. Once you have to backtrack from area 6 and go through areas 5 and 4, back to, I believe, through area 1, 2, 3, and then to 7, you don't really have to go through a lot of Area 4, since most of the crap that you have to go through is in the bottom. And you don't really have to go through there again. But because this game can be a little annoying in destroyer mode, I just have to show off a lot of good strategies when it comes to the optional boss and the raid boss, as I like to call it, because you essentially get ambushed, and I know that it's probably, it's probably called something else, honestly, but I really don't care. It's still um, a bunch of enemies you have to kill, which some of them are actually a lot easier than others, but we'll get to that when we get to it, but... <sighs> but yeah, watch out for those um, shell things. I believe they're only weak to fire and maybe one other gun, I'm not really sure, but just use the fire on them. It, it seems to be the best choice and definitely the most recommended weapon in this area because it can break those blocks. And of course you'll want to save that weapon for Area 6 because of all the ice and shit. But now that we have the map finally, and that took so long it's not even funny, just 10 minutes and we've only scratched the surface, you also want to go ahead and shoot the goop out of there so you can lower the water because you are very not mobile when you are underwater, it's just like Samus in 
uh, Super Metroid without the gravity suit, you are pretty much fucked and you will not get very far at all. But thankfully, we do get the dive ability, which will let us go through underwater freely. Although, you, for some reason, it's very hard to actually make jumps out of it. So, Inti creates for a reason had to create specific sections of level design just so you can actually jump out of it, which is immensely stupid. Like, what is the point? As far as I can tell, there is really only one filler dungeon, and it's actually right before you get in the bottom, so that's neat. Like I said, it's been a while since I played this, but I've had to consult the map quite a bit, and I apologize if you see it during gameplay, but this dungeon is just very, very taxing. And I do actually make a mistake here, which is, I'm going to trim it out. Because I was trying to do some bullshit, and I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't the right way. So I trimmed out a lot of footage, seriously. I had to do a lot of editing in this part, because I just completely kind of got lost in this for some reason. Although this is fairly linear, but this this area is just really something else, honestly. Like, it doesn't feel necessarily uh, maze-like, but it can be when you play. It's kind of hard to describe. Anyway, I actually wait here because I was, uh, I don't know what the fuck I was doing. It's actually been a while, but... I'm waiting for the thing to go by because I wanted to actually fight the boss of this area, I believe, according to the uh, preview, which is, of course, the Spark Salamander, who, unfortunately, I get a very bad run, but I did come up with a strategy that should be just as good, assuming you don't have the wave ability, which, believe it or not, is one of the few bosses in the game that you can actually damage bosses with alongside the final boss. Which I will definitely be using the fuck out of because that boss is just Omega oof. Now, you could be an asshole and use Turbo for this, but because I want to do this legit, I'm not going to do that, so you're not going to see that. <sighs> but unfortunately, this game is just uh, very particular when it comes to destroyer mode. Like, I still don't know why they couldn't add a destroyer mode for Zero Two. Like, it would have greatly benefited for what the game has to offer, and it does, it does have really good boss fights, but it's just... Like, was there not enough funding, or was just not enough interest? Like, I understand people complain about this, and I did for a while too, but after I played it a couple times, I kind of understand how it works. Yeah, this whole parts are just really shitty, but you just have to play a little bit differently compared to normal mode. Like, seriously, normal mode is just, like, way too easy. Like, seriously. There's a reason why when you see people play this game, all they do is use the wave gun, because literally everything else is completely trivial. With the exception of the flame gun in areas 4 and 6, because you need those to activate shortcuts, and everything else is just trivial with that. Seriously, it just completely breaks the game. If you have turbo mode, you're pretty much beaten the game. I would not be surprised if they banned uh, turbo from this game, because, or at least a speedrunning, because it just completely trivializes the game. Like, I guess it's like a power fantasy, but it's like... It almost plays itself in a way, and it's actually sad, because this game is great, like seriously. This is like, one of the few reboots I can honestly say that it is absolutely worth playing, even if you may not really be in the Blaster Master or older games like it, but... I promise you this game is worth your time and money, seriously, this thing is only $10. And even if you don't have a powerful PC, I'm sure this can run in there just fine, like whether you have a PC or even... PS4 or Switch, and I'm pretty sure it's even coming to Xbox One. There is just no excuse not to play this game. Like, it's so good. Hell, it even has a two-player mode. A shitty co-op mode was added to be an update, but it's still something, which... Zero Two has absolutely none of that, and they reused the two-player gimmick for Canada's Raising Simulator, which is... Kinda dumb, but... <laughs> I will definitely be talking about that a little bit more when we get into Blast of Master Zero Two. But anyway, I actually, I think this is where I start to get a little sloppy, and I start to lose my gun upgrades, and I'm like, ah, shit, I'm taking too much damage, I lost the gun now, I don't have the flame, and I'm just like, what the fuck. And I'm also being very mindful of the, uh, the wave that comes by, since again, much like in the previous dungeon, you will be washed away, unless you actually hug this wall, which I didn't think it could do, but, you know... You learned something new, I guess, as you've been watching back your footage. And of course, since the uh, tad rolls also changed position, I wanted to make sure that I was uh, doing this right. But yeah, it seems like when they are in their shell is when they are 
uh, not able to be attacked again unless you have the, the, the flame gun. But again, I get a very bad run and I end up having to fight the boss with like the bare minimum, which really sucks. It's, uh, most of the fruits to speak for itself. I believe that the old fruit, was, you have to kind of cut around corners, I think, on the bottom and stuff, so it, it should be fairly simple. I just can't really give much strategy other than just shoot this, watch out for that, avoid the sass, I'll always flank him from the uh, slanted view because he's, his cone of vision is, does not allow him to shoot at 45 degree angle, only what's in front of him. Although he can, he can be a very, he can be a very big asshole and just turn around for no real reason, so do not try to attack him from behind because he'll just likely turn around and just shoot in the face and you'll lose your gun upgrades and you'll probably die because... Again, your iframes are just not as high as they were in the original, and you will likely die faster, and also since you only get 8 health points. So, try not to get hit a lot. If you have to get hit a lot, then, well, you know... Yeah, this is this is a very sloppy move, unfortunately, from yours truly. And I honestly do believe this is around here is where I start to get really sloppy, because I'm like, okay, I'm at the end, but then I just completely choke it up, but... After a couple attempts, I do finally get a good strategy, which they are, like, yeah, I just lost a whole bunch of gun upgrades, and I'm like, this dungeon is so long, like, this is, like, almost, like, maybe four minutes, and just how long this takes, because this game on this room, and again, like, it, you have to play a lot differently compared to, the, to normal mode, which I don't mind, I don't really mind it at all, I mean, yeah, some parts are bullshit, I'm not gonna deny that, like, some parts really could've used some tweaking, but you have to understand how it works. If you want to talk about it, you kind of have to learn it a little bit. It's like... I don't understand why these people who critique games, they don't even understand what the fuck they're talking about sometimes. It's like, yeah, I don't like Dark Souls. Honestly, I hate it, but I at least put my time and effort into it so that when I do talk about it, I don't look like a fucking idiot. Uh, speaking of idiot, uh, go ahead... Actually, make sure you hit that checkpoint. I almost did it for some reason. And I had to... Um, reset a lot. Uh, I actually tried this a lot. As you can see, I, I equipped the sub-weapon, which this playthrough of Destroy Mode really made me fall in love with uh, the sub-weapons, because they're actually useful. It's just you don't really get to see their true potential. Now for Spark Salamander. What you want to do is go up to him and just spam the fuck out of the use button, since the the remote mine, I believe, is is can be manually detonated. Then go ahead and throw the rest of your sub-weapons. You'll want to be careful though, because Spark Salamander, when his health starts getting low, it will start to shoot three at once. And then use the uh, the stun ability in order to shoot the rest of them. Now this may look easy, but I have died a lot trying to do this, because this boss fight can be very tricky. And also people like, oh, well you didn't do it legit because you used sub-weapons, so that's cheating. It's like, okay, like those idiots who say that using ranged weapons in Dark Souls because they're cheap and cheating. Like, seriously, I will never understand these fucking people. <laughs> like, seriously, the struggle is already hard enough. But anyway, speaking of uh, easy mode, we actually do get one of the best abilities in the game, which is the uh, the laser shot, or whatever it's called. It's the, it's the charging weapon that I'm using right now. You actually get this a lot earlier in the normal mode, but in the story mode around this time is when the game starts to become a little easier since even though you have to charge this thing, it does not it does not use any energy whatsoever, so always have this equipped. It goes through walls like enemy shots, so you can easily go through enemies' defenses if you need to. And since it doesn't replace your normal shot, you should always have this equipped if you're not using anything else. But now, uh, speaking of uh, sub weapons, though, we're actually gonna go ahead and use the um, the uh, warhead missiles, which is actually called. I had to look this up, but I just call it the triple shot because you know it's the three missiles or whatever. Anyway, with this earth shattering tyrant, who is actually known as Jirol in fucking Japan instead of uh, River Roll. Uh, what you want to do basically is just spam the fuck out of the, uh, the the triple shot and just go to town on him. Uh, I believe people have uh, speculated this was supposed to be Fred back in the day, but no, this is apparently a separate character, so who knows, maybe this character was actually the frog you fought in the uh, original game. But anyway, you have to be very careful because this boss can actually summon these uh, uh, red bees, who if he eats enough, not only will he get his health back, but he'll also turn red and the fight becomes a lot harder, and you don't want that, so... 
try not to hover too much or actually do switch to hover so that you can get just a little bit of air time without wasting the jump and just watch out for when he does that he'll do the spitting attack and you know just you know when he does the when he spits out his tongue he'll he'll cover a lot of ground so you'll want to make sure you get airborne or run away if you need to but basically don't waste a lot of your special meter and just spam missiles and of course you know shoot you use the shoot button a lot shoot button and uh the, the triple missile combo and you'll probably take them out in no time this fight i'm not gonna lie took me quite a bit to learn but again it's not hard but unfortunately that was only two of four tank boss battles and you get one more in area six we don't know what we all don't know what that one is and then there's one more at the very end of the game which I will talk about a little more how I feel about that because I have a very interesting experience I want to share when I get to the final video of this guide and walkthrough, which will of course be the ever so wonderful secret area nine, which is a uh, a very fun experience if you're playing this for the first time. It's like you think you're at the end, but nope, there's still one more area. But I'm also spoiled this now. I have absolutely no goddamn idea why all these games have these secret final areas that just do not let you return to the previous area like no joke i've had to have at least at least in this game three separate areas because or three separate saves sorry one right before the final boss in area eight one right before the final boss in area nine and then of course a clear save because this game for a reason once you beat the final boss you have a clear save but it just doesn't let you it just saves right before the, it saves right before the final boss so you can't even go back and explore area 9 which is really bullshit they do fix this in zero two a little bit but you still can't return to the other planets so i guess it makes sense story wise but it's just annoying as fuck anyway speaking of annoying as fuck we have yet another dungeon which has this wonderful stuff which is of course the darkness which if you feel like you're not going to be able to do this properly, just throw the flashbang and then leave and then come back and this area will stay lit. Apparently the game does have a save flag or something, whatever technical bullshit you want to spew out. Remembers what dungeons are lit and what others aren't, so just throw one out when you're in, you're in doubt and just, um, you know, go nuts. This dungeon is a little more complicated and I believe this is the one with the... Uh, the item, the health item, which will make for a very useful uh, recovery since you don't get extra health points in this, but as I mentioned, you do get a full health resource, so use them. They are very good for you, and you also, again, have to collect them in order to get 100%. I have to stress this because people, you know, they're like, oh, why don't I get the best ending because you didn't collect everything. You have to do this in this game, which I'm very much glad that Zero Two kind of did away with this. Because you only have to collect the three emblems, which don't, aren't really tied to specific upgrades. At least, I think a couple of them aren't, but I know that one of them you have to get upgrades for, but the others uh, are pretty much optional. But anyway, we got the health upgrade, well, the health, uh, the, the neutral state, gray scale upgrade, health upgrade, sorry, which, again, doesn't it doesn't give you extra health, but it does give you a full restore, which... You could just viably just leave the um, dungeon and restart and then do that if you want to get your full health for both you and Sophia. But if you're not trying to do that sort of cheesy shit, this is a very good way of getting your health back without having to farm enemies or breaking a bunch of blocks to get some Minecraft in order to get all your good stuff. Now, believe it or not, we're not done yet. Yes, I know this video is very long, but so is this area and my dick. No, I'm just kidding. We do have to go through the door that I, I went to earlier again, but I skipped it because I went completely the wrong way. So I skipped, I trimmed that out for your convenience. You'll thank me later with a beer, okay? Anyway, use the uh, charge, uh, the laser beam shot to shoot the mines underneath you so that you don't actually step on them. They're very annoying in this area, but they are one of the, probably one of the only obstacles as far as I can tell, it actually does not shoot a bullet at you, which is nice, but you still want to be mindful of them because they will catch you by surprise, even though they're loud, they're pulsing, and they're kind of annoying at times, but, you know, that's the nice thing about this weapon is that it actually is useful, but it can still be used as a utility if you want to make the game just a little bit easier. 
Now you're probably thinking, well, what about the other best item in the game, the homing missiles? You don't get that till late later, unfortunately, and those actually do kind of break the game, but we will be using the fuck out of them once we do. And also, just for good measure, go ahead and activate the doors before you hit the checkpoint. I know it sounds kind of weird, but the game also does remember the, um, the position of the doors, and it's just best to have them uh, open when you want to engage in Mortal Kombat. Now, fair warning, I actually do skip out on the item here. The the, the boss, uh, the raid boss, which... I have no idea why I did this. I was, I was pretty rusty at this since I just got, at the time, I got done playing the... The PS4 version, and then I was just like... That version just completely burned me out, but I'm like, I wanted to record a guide for this, especially since Zero Three is coming out, and I really want to make sure that I show my appreciation by doing a guide on a game like this, since, you know, it's this game, at least in the story mode, is very much worth playing. <laughs> but also, I just... I, I, I don't know, It's uh, I'll, there's not really that many actual guides for this, but what I actually did there is as I just went to the dungeon, I, I I clicked on restart games to get my health back, or at least I did, I'm not sure, but I did something alright, I don't know, I, I just, actually no way, I used it as a checkpoint, excuse me, I used it as a checkpoint because I didn't want to do all that bullshit again, but I don't believe the game actually does save those as checkpoints, you actually have to save at the, at the retry points if you want to save your game, so... You want to keep that in mind, because I think that actually screwed me over one time I was playing. Like, wait, why did the game not save my status? And I'm like, oh, because I didn't hit those. But if you don't feel you're going to make it, just hit the retry option when you're in a dungeon, and you'll get all your health back and also affect Sophia. A very cheesy but w very worthwhile tactic, since this game is hard as balls. At least the story mode is, but we are at least now halfway through the game, hopefully. At least for the Sander game. Which, I know there's technically the credits after you beat the... Get the bad ending or whatever, but we all know that's not the... We all know that's not the true ending. And plus, real men get the real ending, which is, of course, getting all the items and... Saving the titty girl, Eve, at the end, who... Surprisingly, this game is not, is not very stacked, which I really don't mind. It's actually kind of cute looking, you know, for a support droid. Oh my god, she's not human! Anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about that and other shit in the next area because we're going to be going on an underwater cruise. Thanks for watching and you take care.